Hi, everyone. So my name is Jacob. I'm currently a master's student at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. And um, I'm hoping to finish my degree in the next couple of months, after which I will also be on the job market. And I'm here today to talk about some of my work today in leveraging the MLIR ecosystem for efficient differentiable programming. So to briefly motivate this talk, gradients are everywhere today in machine learning, um, uncertainty analysis, probabilistic programming, you name it. Virtually all of modern deep learning uses gradient-based methods via automatic differentiation, or AD, to train. Recently, there has been an increased attention to an evolving paradigm called differentiable programming, which essentially takes the same problem form of uh, deep learning, but generalizes our notion of what a model can be. You can run gradient descent on arbitrary parameters on arbitrary code to differentiate through things like ray tracers or physics engines. And this image that we see is differentiating through a fluid simulation. The goal of my work is to make the process of computing gradients more efficient in terms of both runtime and memory consumption. This is the main point of the talk, which is how our work positions itself in the existing auto diff landscape. The most popular AD methods today perform runtime AD. The disadvantage here is that you can't optimize ahead of time through an optimizing compiler to the same degree. These include methods like PyTorch, TensorFlow Eager, and JAX. Another important point on this landscape is Enzyme, which is a state-of-the-art AD tool that performs automatic differentiation on very low-level LLVMIR. The disadvantage here is that LLVMIR quickly gets very complex, and it can be challenging to apply certain optimizations to your code. We introduce LAGrad, which is a source-to-source -source automatic differentiation system, meaning that it performs compile time AD, and then it exploits high-level high information in the generated code to produce more optimal code. So briefly, I want to go over some background with reverse mode AD. And the takeaway here is that if we have a function, we can break it down to small pieces, differentiate over each piece, and then use the chain rule from calculus to recombine our individual pieces into our overall desired derivative. To make this more concrete, consider the following function. We would like to compute the derivatives of our output y with respect to w and b. First, we break down our function, and we call our original function our primal. We name each of these intermediate values. Then, in order to compute the differential version, or the adjoint, we begin by fixing the gradients with respect to the output. What is the derivative of y with respect to y? Well, it's 1. We call this fixed value our seed value. We then go from the output one step back and we back propagate the derivative with respect to y, and that's the chain rule in action, and we also differentiate our division. Note here that I've highlighted sigma because it is a value originally defined in our primal, but we need it in our adjoint. In general, we first need to compute all of the primal values in our program because we might need them in the adjoint. We take another step, continue to propagate our gradient signal backwards. We introduce another dependency on a primal value, and eventually, we have the desired expressions for um, the derivatives that we want. In the multidimensional case, when we have multiple inputs and multiple outputs, rather than a derivative, we have a Jacobian matrix, which is a matrix of partial derivatives, where each entry is a partial derivative of one output with respect to one of the inputs. A special case of this Jacobian matrix is the output with respect to itself, which is the identity matrix. So remember how we had that fixed seed value? When we have a Jacobian matrix that we're trying to compute, um, our fixed seed value takes the ith column of our desired gradients. Notice how sparse this column is. This becomes important later on. All right, I imagine many of you will be familiar with this, but just in case anyone isn't, I want to briefly go over some preliminaries with the Linalge dialect in MLIR. So this is a representation of a dot product. Um, and you can see pseudocode representing the same code below. The thing I want to draw attention to here is the indexing maps. Each map, and we have one map for every input and output of our op, the inputs of every map describe how many conceptual parallel loops are in the Linalge op, while the outputs dictate how we use those loops to index into our tensors. So dot product, we have this one loop. If we tweak the loops, uh, sorry, tweak the indexing maps, both the inputs and the outputs, we now have a matrix vector multiplication. And as we can see, this represents two nested loops. One more tweak, and we have a matrix matrix multiplication. Again, the outputs of each of the maps dictate how we index into our tensors. 
All right, putting this together, we're ready to talk about the first high-level optimization. Recall that when we're computing these full Jacobian matrices, we have very sparse fixed seed values. When these go into Linnell's generic ops in the adjoint computation, this naturally leads to many differentiated operations that produce sparse tensors that critically have very predictable patterns. For instance, consider our matrix multiplication where we multiply A and B, where B has exactly one non-zero value. It produces C, which has exactly one non-zero column. Notably, the idea of sparsity here is tied to each dimension. So B is sparse in both dimensions, while C is dense in the first dimension and sparse in the second. Being sparse in a dimension here means along the given dimension, there is only one place that can have a non-zero value. And this idea can be extended to allow for a few places that have non-zero values. So bringing this back to the Linalge dialect, when we have these sparse operands to Linalge ops, it's very easy to statically predict the sparsities of our outputs. So say we want to predict the sparsity of C, and this is again our matrix multiplication. All we need to do is look at the indexing maps for all of our inputs. In this case, we only have B, which is sparse along both dimensions, so we mark D2 and D1 sparse. Then we look at the map of the output C and have D0 and D1. The intersection of these is just D1. Going back to our visual example, we can see this matches what we previously observed, where the first dimension of C is dense and the second dimension is sparse. We can then very easily generate code that takes advantage of the sparsity by skipping over known sparse dimensions. Cool, so that was the first optimization. I now want to go to a different kind of optimization to optimize memory. Consider the following function that we can represent with a loop. We want to differentiate over this, but how do we take the derivative of a loop? Well, one way is that we can fully unroll the loop, which leaves us with a linear sequence of instructions that we know how to differentiate. So we do so, and notice again, we have introduced dependencies in the adjoint on primal values. Is there any way that we can preserve the structure of the loop during differentiation? Well, given how regular our adjoint loop is, we can just re-roll it back into a loop, and now we have the primal loop on top and the adjoint loop underneath. There is, however, a problem here. As you can see in the unrolled version, there are all these different z values that we need, but during the primal execution, we keep overwriting them. In order to address this, we use a data structure called the gradient tape, which is essentially a linear list where we store all of the required primal values that we need, such that we can access them in the adjoints. This does, however, have a problem in that the original program can be computed using only constant memory, but the fact that we are now using this tape introduces an overhead of linear memory. Is there any way that we can avoid this? Well, conceptually, the tape is operating just like a cache. And if we are caching something, let's try to recompute it. In this case, this is what this um, arrow is doing. And we can see the recomputation is very cheap. We've now alighted the need for a tape by recomputing. And as a result, we can remove not only the tape, but we can remove the entire primal loop, because we just don't need it. And now our adjoint program has the same memory and performance characteristics as our original program, which is great. So this worked out, but now we're going to take a look at a different example where the same thing doesn't work. Consider the following function, another loop, and observe that our p value here depends on every previous iteration of the loop. At iteration three, it depends on the value of p from iteration two, which depends on the value of iteration one, and so on. What if we try to do the same thing by recomputing p? Well, the fact that we're not storing anything to the tape means that we basically need to start from scratch with every adjoint iteration. Remember, we're iterating in reverse in the adjoints, so the first adjoint iteration requires the last value of p. The second adjoint iteration requires the second last value of p. This ends up creating a triangular lattice of computation, which is asymptotically worse computation-wise than our original program. Since we got to start from scratch, our computation goes from linear to quadratic. So how can we tell ahead of time if it is beneficial to recompute? Well, we can formalize this notion with these two sets. We have adjoint u, which is the set of primal values that we use to compute the adjoints, and the computation of the set is prior work that we won't go into detail here. We can just kind of take for granted because someone else has solved this problem. 
And then we have intervals, which is a set of loop carried primal values and any values that depend on them. If there's no overlap between these sets, it means that the required primal values can be recomputed without depending on previous iterations. This is one of the heuristics that Allegrad uses, among others, to avoid emitting a tape during the autodiff procedure. So bringing this back to MLIR land, we can see that because we are an SSA form, things cannot be overwritten, and this continues to be true for tensors. Um, so in order to have loop carried values, they need to be explicitly represented in the iter args. This is really nice for us because one of the desired sets is iter vals, and we can compute it just by looking at the iter args and any values that depend on them. So we compute our iter set very easily. We compute our adjoint u set, which is prior work. We see there's no overlap in our first example, one has been pseudo MLIR ified. And this is a very strong signal that it is beneficial to recompute versus caching. Conversely, in our second example, when it has been MLIR ified, um, we can see that there is an overlap, which strongly hints to this asymptotic worsening of recomputing versus using the tape. So the MLIR semantics here help us in a lot of ways. In addition to how the iter args must be explicitly represented, the fact that we restrict our tensor to tensors means that we don't need to worry about additional loop dependencies that are introduced from memory side effects. As a result, this analysis scales to incredibly complex programs that have things like nested loops, lenal drops, and it continues to work and is, it remains very easy to compute. So to evaluate the efficacy of both of these optimizations, we compare both the runtime and the memory consumption of our system against Enzyme, which is a state-of-the-art suite on state-of-the-art AD system on um, low-level LLVM IR, and PyTorch, which is our industry standard that computes AD at runtime. The benchmarks are implemented in MLIR using the Linalge tensor and SCF dialects for um, Enzyme and Allegra, that is. PyTorch just starts from the, the Python interface while Enzyme and LIGRAD start from the same MLIR. We also had an additional benchmark, and there are additional optimizations that we don't have time to cover in this talk. So first, we look at adjoint sparsity. And this is just for hand tracking, which is one of the 80 bench benchmarks that requires the computation of a full Jacobian matrix. And as such, it benefits from the sparsity optimizations that we covered. Um, in each of these cases, the results are normalized to, with respect to Enzyme and higher is better. So first, um, with respect to Enzyme, the geo mean across these data sets is a 2.8 times speed up while simultaneously using eight times less memory. Compared to PyTorch, the story is even better where we have 169 times speed up while using 61 times less memory. Next, we look at tape size reduction. In this case, we can see that LA Grad and Enzyme um, have pretty much on par performance, but the memory usage reduction is greatly reduced because of our tape size reduction optimization. We have 74 times less memory usage than PyTorch and 35 times less memory than Enzyme, and we don't compromise performance for doing this. Finally, you can see in this table um, geometric means for all of the benchmarks that we've evaluated, all of the real world benchmarks, that is. Each of these entries is a geometric mean over different data sets. And at the bottom row, we have a geo mean over the columns to get a general sense of the performance of the tool. So by doing compile time AD and leveraging high level information, Allegrad is able to outperform existing systems, often by a pretty wide margin. And that is it for my talk. Thank you for the organizers, the program committee, uh, my supervisor, and all of you for listening. Thank you. Questions, please. I was wondering if you considered using something like Torch MLIR to get from the PyTorch uh, front end code into MLIR and then going down from there. That is a great question. It's something that we have not previously considered, but um, I think similar the similar problems of like losing information during runtime AD would occur. Actually, I'm not sure. Does because I imagine that in order to train, you would first need to do AD to trace the computation graph of PyTorch before you can convert it to MLIR. So the representation would be expanded. That's in that sense. Well, I think you would just take the. I, I assume that's what you did by hand, right? You, you took the PyTorch code and you rewrote it as as MLIR computations, right? 
Oh, well, the PyTorch stayed PyTorch. Um, so we, we used just the Python interface. Py the PyTorch um, system just never touched MLIR. Right, but it seems like you could have done that transformation automatically. Yes, we could have. That is a good thing to look into. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, okay, I'm, I'm known to play devil's advocate, so let's do that. Sure. Um, so you have all this like MLIR stuff, and you have the high level thing in Linalc, which is somewhat high level, and you show that you can express all these things in three lines, and then it's three differentness, and you have all these benefits, you're like, okay, you know, no loop carry dependencies, everything explicit, MLIR is great. But at the end of the day, you're, what, a speed up of less than 10x against a low-level tool like Enzyme that does work on SSA values and FIs and stuff like that? So why is that? Where, where, where's the rest of the speed up? Well, it remains to be seen, I suppose. <laughs> Like it's, you raise an interesting point, but I think the speedups that we observed are still valuable. Agreed. Um, okay, N and then let me try to ask a, a more constructive question. Okay. <laughs> uh, the the optimization that you're the optimization that you're showing, like sparsity and so on and so forth. You think you could put that kind of domain knowledge in those domain specific optimization things into a low level tool, or do you think that is just not a a thing to be done. That certainly would be interesting. Um, part of the entire motivation for doing it at a higher level than, than um, LLVMIR is because it seems like an error-prone and manual process. We were inspired by the work done implementing sparse compilers in MLIR, mm -hmm. um, where like in the paper, the entire thing, as they say, if you need to do this manually, it's very error-prone. Mm -hmm. yeah, fair. But it's not impossible, and it is it's like an exciting new direction. Uh, sorry. Hey, um, can you maybe go back uh, two or three slides to the benchmarks? Uh, because I have a question, basically. So you said that um, you take AD bench, right? Yes. Which is, uh, I mean, I think most of it is in, written in C. Yeah. Um, so how do you get the MLIR for the AD bench benchmarks? And basically, then I suppose for Enzyme, you do MLIR and then you lower through, through pipe to LVM dialect and to LVM translate, I suppose? Yes, that is exactly right. And for completeness, we also measured starting from C. Um, that is just like line by line verbatim what was in the AD bench for Enzyme. And we do see that in most cases, the performance is pretty similar. Okay, but, but for... But, it's work. But for LA grad, right, you, yep. you have to start from MLIR. So how do you get, the, get it into, into LA grad from AD bench? Um, we manually implemented um, MLIR by hand. So there is currently not a front end for the system, but I mean, we could implement one through MLIR. Thank you. Right. So um, reverse mode AD is, of course, a good choice if you have a scalar output and a large number of inputs, but you are in a situation where you want to compute entire Jacobians. Yes. Um, so I was wondering what does, you know, how does the number of rows and the number of columns in your Jacobian compare? And wouldn't it make sense to use forward mode AD instead, where you, know, you would completely avoid all this storing of intermediates or recomputation and all, all these problems that you're dealing with? Yes, absolutely. And especially as the number of rows in the Jacobian gets very large, then forward mode is absolutely the right decision. Um, in this case, I think we were mainly looking at what could be done, because the same idea with sparsity can be applied, um, whether it's in forward or reverse, because actually with forward mode, there's a similar idea of seeding it with a one-hot vector. So just, it was more about the idea of sparsity in AD than about specifically reverse mode AD. Okay, and then um, I guess somewhat related to that, um, I guess you are aware of the checkpointing work? In, yes. Uh, so that, that I don't know, might be an improvement over, over these sort of ad hoc, I recompute only when there's no dependency and otherwise I store a kind of heuristics. Have you, have you looked into these? Well, the basic idea of my understanding of checkpointing is that it makes this explicit trade-off between space and time, whereas right, exactly. um, in this case, we only make this optimization when we know that we can get rid of the primal loop. So we know that we're not paying extra for 
And it's not really recomputation, it's just moving the computation. It's conceptually reordering the loop. Sorry, one last, one last question. Um, so you also had JAX on your first slide, and I have a question, because for JAX it's really easy to put out MLIR, right? Why, is there any specific reason why you didn't uh, use, uh, comp compared with a JAX benchmark, for example, where it's really easy to get the MLIR and then you know, take it from MHLO and convert it to when your LA grad can start working on it? That is a good question, and in full transparency, it is, it is news to me that you can very easily get MLIR from JAX, so that would be a great thing to look into in the future. Thank you. More questions? Thank you for attending the student technical talk. The closing section will start at 6 p.m. Yes, please. Thanks all our speakers.